Okay, so the faculty survey was a 15 question survey and that was sent out with IRB approval, of course. Um, <laughs> um, and that was sent out at the end of 2016. Um, what the 111 faculty members responded to that um, survey and it was sent out to all of the faculty full and um, adjunct. So from that su survey, we realized that 87 faculty members of the 111 were currently using Blackboard. Um, so, and that was not just for fully online, that was fully online, hybrid, and supplementally. So those faculty who teach face-to-face -face and use e-learning to supplement their course spaces. Do you have a question, Raviva? I thought the number was low, how many faculty members, but that is of the 111. Right. So out of 111 yeah. who responded, 87 um, answered that one question. Because so what happened was, even though we had 111 responses, not everybody answered every question. Oh. <laughs> so there were some skips. 65% okay. um, of the faculty who said they were not using Blackboard did express um, an interest in learning more about it. Um, and 73% of the faculty that were um, surveyed said that they were using publisher content. Now, whether that was publisher content that they put into e-learning or whether it was not using the e-learning system at all and just going through the publisher. Um, and, and we're really trying to get faculty to look at the cost of the book, the cost of the code to use the publisher content and different ways that they can implement to um, reduce that for students. And 9% of the people forego using Blackboard altogether and either use their LMS um, publisher or their own websites. We have a few people here today who that falls into. Them. So uh, 107 people responded to this particular question. And 63 indicated they never attended a Blackboard or e-learning workshop offered by anyone in the site lab. And so we have all of these people who are using the system, but they're not using it as well as they could and they don't know all of the tools that are available and, or they don't know specifically how those tools can um, reach their students. The second part of that question was if you did not attend a workshop, if you worked with individual members. So if you worked with one of the ID team or if you worked with um, one of the site lab staff members one-on-one. -on -one. So a lot of people had worked specifically one-on-one -on -one without going to a workshop, which was encouraging. <laughs> so the features that are most used according to the people who answered the survey were announcements. 82% of faculty who use Blackboard use the announcements feature. 74% use messages. 71% use the email embedded id blackboard 64% um, use the grade center 52% use testing 50% use discussion boards and 49% use the calendars okay so 20 responses were dealing with specific issues related to student submissions using the tools such as discussions and assignments and tests and surveys. The largest need expressed by faculty for this open-ended question was um, support for Grade Center. 21% um, of the faculty wanted um, grade, 22% of the faculty wanted Grade Center support. VoiceThread, which 
a lot of you who are attending today use 34% um, of the faculty that took the survey either did not know about VoiceThread or wanted more specific training in how to use VoiceThread. And one of the great things about VoiceThread is now they have closed captioning and they have, so if you've created a VoiceThread and you put your PowerPoint up and you do a voiceover, VoiceThread will automatically close caption that for you. But when I created this, that wasn't one of the things, features that were uh, available in VoiceThread. So we had to go back and redo all of that. And they also now have a gradable item. So if you're creating a VoiceThread and you want that attached to your grade book, it will. So you, you can go in and, and review what the students have either posted or commented. So that was another piece that we had to add in. So we had to change all of that. Um, link checker. So the link checker, uh, what it does is there's in course tools, there's an area where you can click on link checker and it will go in and it will make sure that the links, the web links that you have in your course as web links, if they're not active, you'll get a red X and then you know to go back and review them. So it's a quick way if you're using a lot of web links to check your course to make sure that everything you have in there is active and available. Surveys. 30% of faculty wanted to know more about surveys. Um, date management. 30% either had not heard of the date management tool in Blackboard or wanted more information on how to use that tool. Um, the Grade Center, again, 22%, and discussion forums was um, 19%. And discussion forums in e-learning are not the most intuitive to use. Um, so so it, it is complicated. You don't just create a discussion and students get to see it. You have to create it. You have to link to it. You have to make sure that if you set dates in one place that they're not set in another place differently. So there, so there are a lot of steps for a successful implementation of discussion forums. So 85% of those surveyed expressed they would utilize an online faculty training area. Um, so the, train, the target audience for this training is all faculty, whether that be full-time or adjunct who work at Bristol. And the training will be completely contained within the learning management system. These are the topics that are going to be covered in this training. So exploring the Grade Center, accessing and setting up Grade Center, and all of these pieces like manually created columns, those are all pieces that fit into the Grade Center. Um, grade columns, creating categories, smart view, grading color codes and column organization. That's, that all of that lives inside of the grade center. So there's a lot of pieces that fit into that one tool, which more than half the um, faculty that responded to the survey use. So this was a big um, tool for, so I'm gonna minimize this and I'm just gonna bring up So I've created a faculty e-learning resources 101 area. And this is where all of that content is gonna live. So Blackboard has some really great resources. So if it was already created, I'm not reinventing the wheel. I'm using things that are already out there that have closed captioning and that work well. So the first thing that I wanted to um, reach out to faculty 
doing this training were. Do you teach online or do you want to teach online? If you want to teach online and you don't yet, then these are the resources that you're going to use to get there. So the first step, filling out the application to teach online, reaching out to your dean, reaching out to the dean of e-learning. These are all steps in the process to teach online that not everyone is aware of. And then also developing a syllabus. It's, it's not always easy to know what, if you've never taught before. This is the first semester I'm teaching, teaching a class for CIS. And I had never created a syllabus. I've helped other faculty member create a syllabus. But personally, I had never created my own syllabus. So I said, oh, this is going to be easy. I'll just put all the stuff that I tell everybody to use. And then I did it. And I said, April, can you look at this? And she said, you know, this is missing and this is missing. And where you're teaching is missing. And, and I went, oh, but I have the disability service stuff in there. <laughs> and the link works. And she said, that's great. But you also have to put your name and how they can contact you. And <laughs> I said, oh, maybe I better go back and read what we have in the e-learning the e 101 space. So that's some of the things that we put in here. like. The check, what's on the checklist? What should you have in there? What do you need to have in there? If you're going to teach online, it's different than a face-to-face -face class because in a face-to-face -face class, you can say, okay, no phones or don't use your computer or um, I'll, I'll get back to you on that next week when you come in or next class, I'll give you those grades back. But if you're in an online class, every day is, an, is a class because they can access it 24-7, seven days a week. But you may not answer an email at 3 o'clock in the morning when they're doing their homework. And if you haven't stated that in your syllabus or somewhere, then they're expecting that instant turnaround. So you can say, I answer my email 9 to 5 on business days. I may respond to you on the weekend, but may not. So. I, or I grade on, on the weekend, on Saturday and Sunday, expect to get all of your grades back on those days. So when you're teaching in an online environment, fully online, you really need to spell those pieces out. So there's a lot of that information built into here. So I'm ready to start developing my course. What do I do? The first thing you do is, is gather up the materials that you would use in your face-to-face -face course and make an appointment with an instructional designer. And there's myself and there's Thais in New Bedford who do that. So those are some of the things. Of course, it, right here it says make sure you contact the Dean of eLearning and go through the rest of these modules before you start doing that because it may be something that's not going to be offered online or it may be something that there's other things that have to be done before it could be offered online. And then, of course, we built something in here about accessibility. Um, so when you're dis it is better to create good design when you're designing it than backwards design. So it's, it's easier if you say, OK, I'm going to use this video, but I'm going to find something that already has closed captioning versus, well, I'll just put this up, and then later I'll find one that meets what I need. Because I don't have anybody this semester who needs closed captioning, so this will work. But then you never go back and fix it. So if you, f if you build it correctly, then no matter who's in your class, it's accessible and it's, and it's easy for them to use. Anybody have any questions so far? So exploring the grade center. So this is just module one, which I've redone. I have to redo module two, so I changed the, the images so that I know which one I finished and which one I didn't. So this is, these are the things in module one that are covered. And um, so what we did was we created video, so using Screencast-O-Matic. Um, and we walked through, okay, so this is how you get to your grade center. So log into your class on the left-hand menu, click on full grade center, because if you're brand new to e-learning, you may not know where some of these tools are located. So we started off at a very basic. This is where you find it. This is what it does. These are, you know, how you use it. 
And then once we did that, we create, I, I created um, PDFs. And so this is where you find create a column and what create a column does. So each one of those tutorials walks through one specific area of one specific tool. And again, anytime there's any changes in the system, I have to go back and recreate all of those. I have a question. Sure. My question is two part. Mm -hmm. Ask the first part so I can answer it and then ask the second because I'll get confused and forget. Do you Yes. Yes. That will. That's under tra traversing test. I tried to come up come up with catchy little names for the um where everything is included. But yeah, that that's that's already in there. How to make a makeup? How to um how to um allow a student extra time? how to allow a student who missed the exam, who's gonna, you want to allow to take it before everybody else because they're gonna be away, how to set that up so that they can take the same exam without anything being shown, or if you want them to do the makeup, how to make a makeup. The second part is, are there plans to simplify that process by Blackboard? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, above, that's above my pay grade, thanks. Yeah, no. Um, we, we do put in suggestions on things, and I have about 25 of them in the system right now. Um, either bugs that need to be fixed, or things that don't work correctly, or, um, and usually the response back is, we, we are working on that, it will be released at a future time, and then they put us on a list, and when that release happens, they notify us. So that's not but that's not one of them that's, ever been um, said, oh yeah, we're working on that. That's kind of one that a lot of people have put in requests to have that feature. Um, discussion boards is another one. A lot of people have put in requests to have that feature revisited and, and you know, streamlined a little better. Uh, but that's not something that they're working on, and that I know of. Uh -huh. so, so if I teach a face-to-face -face class, right, <coughs> and I don't use the system to give quest, quizzes, sorry, um, I bring my quiz in, I hand them out, the student takes the quiz, and I only meet once a week, I meet on Monday. So I bring the tests home and I grade them on Monday night. I can manually go in, and I could say to the student, I'm gonna grade these tonight, look in Blackboard for your, for your grades. And then I go in and I manually create a column and I call it quiz, two, and I put their grades in. Oh. And then, so they don't have to wait a full week to get that right. grade. So that's specifically what you're using the grade book as a... As Supplementally. A, as a supplementary mm -hmm. for face to face. Well, that thinking, wait, I the online e-learning, I don't, I mean, yeah, the columns are... Right. But yeah, because you're, you're creating the quiz, you're creating the discussion right. form that's so graded in, the in, in there. But if you're having a face-to-face a -face discussion and you want to okay. give them a grade for that or participation, or you want to say, you know, at the end of the semester, just look in Blackboard and your grade will be already figured out. And that's what a lot of faculty members who teach face-to-face -face are doing. They're using the grade book supplementally. So the students know, like at midterm, okay, so where am I midterm? Now I know this isn't like, you know, set in stone, but it gives me an idea of what I need to do to keep that or, or, or bring it up or move along. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions? It's unrelated, but the attendance feature, are you planning to keep that? I know we it is, it, that's built into Blackboard now. We had gotten, we had um, purchased quickly, which was an attendance feature and we had a couple of dozen faculty test it out. I think, I don't know if you were on the list. Yeah, and we got a lot of feedback that it was not wonderful. So we didn't want to pay for something that either was not going to be utilized or was not working the way it was 
you know, like. So when Blackboard built in the attendance, we did the upgrade and we, go, and, and we, did the attend, we got the attendance thing and we couldn't turn it on. We couldn't figure out what was going on. Come to find out they hadn't changed our version. They just did an update on the one that we were in. So last year when I went to Blackboard World, I met with the um, people who work in the back end of Blackboard um, at DevCon. And I said, okay, so here is my system. Here I am, this is what I'm on. And why, can't, why won't attendance turn on? And the gentleman looked at it and he said, oh, you're on the wrong version. Just put it in and tell them you want to update to X, Y, Z. So it's here to And now, it's, so it's, it's here and it's here to stay. Unless Blackboard takes it away. Because they, sometimes they give it and sometimes they take it away. <laughs> but um, the, the only caveat with attendance is if you turn it on to test it in your class, you can't turn it off. So if you click on attendance and you say, I want to use the attendance tool in this class, you get a grade book entry that says attendance. And then you cannot go in and delete that column or remove it or say I'm not using it. Then you'd have to either hide it from the students and hide it from yourself because it, it will, will not go away. The great thing about the attendance tool, though, is if you meet twice a week or if you meet once a week, you can go in and you can say, you know, this date, these people were in, and you could change that, like this looks like this, this looks like this. So you can really um, customize it. Any other questions? The other thing that I added in here was um, a resources area. I will be putting one for OER in here so that if anyone who wants to use OER can get some basic idea, what is OER, how can I use it, how does it help my students, you know, that kind of information. Um, I'm going to probably meet with Sue Susan Moore and um, maybe one other piece person from the Lash Center or the library and get them to um, help. You know, like what should we include in that? What needs to be covered um, for faculty buy-in? Um, we already have one in here for embedded librarians. And what, what are the instructions to um, get that to happen? So. We have one on copyright, and um, this is what it's called. Co about copyright when the lawyer isn't looking, or when the copyright police aren't going into your course. So <coughs> you know, like just some, you know, the Teach Act works for some things, and it does not work for some things. So that's another thing that we have to um, be careful about for online learning. Okay, and my last slide is about some tools that are available. And anyone who wants, I have a list of about, I don't know, 80 tools now. Um, if you want that list, I can send it to you. Just shoot me an email at diane.forand at bristolcc.edu or to the site lab and just say, Diane, I'd like your free tools list. So these are some of the tools that I threw up here that I find very um, interesting. So Unsplash, Unsplash is images. They're high quality digital images and there's probably about a million and a half images on that site. So if you're creating a PowerPoint and you don't want it to be boring like mine was with just text. You go to Unsplash and you find something that relates to what you're doing and you throw it in there or in a PDF or if you're creating a flyer um, and you want something specific to what your flyer is about, you can go to Unsplash. You just look in there and, and, and they are high quality pictures. So when you put them into your website or e-learning and you resize them, they don't lose pixel quality. 
no matter how big or small it is, it, it stays Are you quality. able to click on that now to show us one or two, or is that not possible? I can. Thank I you. put these in as web links. Okay, so let's see if it opened behind. It did not. So, so unsplash. This is it. So you just put in whatever you're looking for. The last presentation I did this, I had some people from culinary, so I put beef in there. <laughs> and, and that was not a good, <laughs> it was not something good. I mean, we had a lot of cows, and, and everybody chuckled. And now, like, that's the big joke. Diane likes beef. <laughs> so, so that's not what I'm going to use today. Um, but the great thing about these are they're all open resources. So there is no copyright. You can use any picture on here that you find. Everything is open, everything is free, everything is available. Why don't you put diversity? So there are 348 <coughs> photos that have been tagged as diversity. Mm -hmm. So depending on what you were doing or how you were doing it. I, I, like, I like the cups of coffee. Right, right. Yeah. <coughs> but see, so. Yeah, it's also interesting what comes out of it. Right. I'm just curious. So it's like one particular group is missing. Mm -hmm. I don't know why one group is not included. So, yeah, so that's what we get when we, we look at diversity. There's not always something that you can use, but it's a great place to. Um, check out. Okay, so one of the other slide out is slide.do is so you I if I'm doing a presentation and I want feedback from the audience, I create a slide out and then on my slide I put and I think Jen you use this, right? Slide slido Okay, so it so you put you put the um, code in, and then everybody just goes to slide dot do dot com, and on their phone they put the code in, and it brings up whatever your question is, and everybody types in answers, and as they type in the answers, it pops up on the on the on the slide on the screen. This is a great interactive tool to um, help build, like. One of the um, sessions that I went to at Blackboard World, they used that Slido, and that's how I got a lot, a lot of the new free tools that I have, because they had a, a tech app, it was called App Smackdown, and everybody in the audience went to the Slido, and you put in tools that you were using that were free. And then they sent it out, that slide out to everybody at the um, session. So it was, it was a really great resource. Pull everywhere, yeah. But this one kind of makes like a word jumble, you know, you know, like the word cloud, word cloud. That's what I was looking for. And so, if you and I both put in the same words, that will be bigger because more than one person did it. Flipgrid is we have it free, um, and it's through Microsoft. So if you um, check that out, it's it's cool. Um, I was at a presentation from um, Bridgewater State University. Eric LePage did it. And he teaches a class and he used Flipgrid. So what Flipgrid is, is students take a video of themselves on the phone and they put it up and then other students can comment on it. So if they have a question about something or if they have a concern about something, they do it and then it gets uploaded into the course versus VoiceThread. They can do it quickly on their phone, ask a quick question and, and send it off. Yeah. So you can embed all these apps in your in your Blackboard environment. Some of them are embeddable, some of them are not. But like Slido, you really wouldn't want to embed it in embed it into your um, 
e-learning, that's more of a class. Like if you have a question and you want to see if people are paying attention, anybody who gets this, you know, if, if everybody gets it right, right, it's, it's exactly like using a click. -off. The difference is instead of having choice A, choice B, choice C for the clicker, it's open-ended. So the students have to input what their answer is. Or say, so, so the end of the class you say, okay, before the final exam, I want everybody to type in one thing that they learned from this class. Like what was your big takeaway from this class? And everybody types in a different thing. And, or some people type in the same thing and then you know, okay, so this was something they learned and they really liked because it stuck with them. So I wanna make sure that I really cover that the next time I teach this class or whatever it is the question is. You can bring it back in and make it. Um... So when they submit that, when do they submit it? It, it? it saves in your Slido account. So when they do it, it's like they're texting it and it's all saving and then when you're done, you can go back and review it. It's not gonna tell you who submitted what or you know what word was from who, but it, you will get, you will have that saved. Live binders is another thing. So those of you who do want students to keep track of things, like an e-portfolio, you can have them create a live binder. And they get five, I think, free. Uh, free live binders, and they can put anything that they have a web link to, anything that they have saved on their computer, so if they have a Word document, if they have an Excel sheet, if they have a PDF, they can throw it in that live binder and create a track that they can, sh that is shareable to the outside world. So if you are an art student and you want to create a portfolio of some of your artwork, you could scan it in, throw it into live binder, and then when you go to apply for a position or you want to go somewhere and show someone your portfolio, you can send them that link. So when included in your resume or included in your cover letter and say, here are some samples of what I can do. I would really be great for your company because X, Y, and Z. And then they can look at it and they can see, like if you've designed a website, the link to that website would be in that live binder. So they could go and look at what your work looks like. But it's also great if, you're, if you have a class that they're going to, or, or a degree that they're going to continue to build on specific items. You could have them create that live binder portfolio, and then next semester they don't say, well, I don't have that anymore. Yeah, it's in your live binder. That was part of the assignment. That, that was part of what we did um, so that they could use it again. Let me go here and here. Like post it. All right, so play po I don't I don't have my login information on me right now. Play post it is where they can create and share interactive videos. See, so this is a, it's a free account if you're um, an instructor. So what you do is you create a video and then you say, well, what if you did this? What would happen? So they, you know, so remember those books when you were a kid and you could choose your own ending? So you read a little bit of it and then you said, well, I don't want to do that. I want to do this. So then you read that and it said, okay, this is your choice and this is your choice. So as you go through this, you can build those what if scenarios. So here's the video or here's the text and then you could do A or B. If you do A, well, you fell off the ledge and you died. Or, you know, if you do B, you continue on and do, you know, whatever it is you're doing. 
So SIL teaches um, coding, right? So you could say, if I did this, would it do this or this? Or if I change that, what would happen? This, this, or this. So then you know if the students are getting it, and it's, and it's kind of a fun exercise. Um, HP5 is, I always say HP5, and it's not, it's H5P. So H5P is phenomenal. So you can create examples in that one. These are all of the feature things that you can do with H5P. You can create any of these types of content. Drag the words, hotspots, pairing things. So this is a very powerful tool does a lot of things. Um, and this is a branching scenario. So you've created this, you do your video, and you say A or B, and then you record what happens if you do A, and you record what happens what do, if you do B, or, you, or if you do C. So I'm just going to click on this, and I don't know if we have sound, but so this is how it works. And this was created by um, the Eaton School of Nursing in Canada. So this is a little better probably than I would create, which is why I use this one, because they put a lot of time and effort in creating this particular. Um, so how it works. If you get the correct answer, you get a green check mark. If you choose an answer that is not the best, it tells you. That wasn't the best answer. Go back and try again. Or if it's incorrect. Okay. So I'm going to proceed. So this is, they gave them a case study. This is the information that they need before they go on a home visit to visit Irina. And this is what has been happening, and this is why you are being sent as a nurse or a social worker to this particular person. So it goes, this, this particular branching goes from getting out of the car to how you interact with the person at the door. So then you have choices. So what do you do? Do you refer to an arranged appointment? Do you express concern for the client? Do you refer to the men to mental health assessment? Or do you want to replay the video because you're not sure what you're supposed to do? So what do you think? Anyone? This one? Okay. Hi, I'm Ann Jones, a community nurse. I'm here for the appointment we arranged yesterday. Okay, please come in. <laughs> Hello. As I said at the door, my name is Ann Jones. I'm a nurse who visits families in the community. We offer many services in this community for young families. You might be interested in these. Okay, uh, would you like to sit down? So now you're going to get a choice of where you want to sit. So you can remain standing. You can offer to sit down at the table. You can ask her where she wants you to sit, sit on the couch, or replay the video in case you want to watch it again. So what do you think? Ask her where to sit. Ask her where to sit? Yes. Where would you like me to sit? Uh, 
we could sit here on the couch or uh, at the table here. <laughs> So, so then it tells you that was not the best choice to do and what seating arrangement will promote active listening as well as maintain your safety. So then you proceed and then you get to choose again. So if you, I'm just going to tell you, if you choose to sit on the couch, that's wrong because she's going to sit right on the side of you and that's not you're not ensuring your safety. So you really want to sit down at the table because it's a single chair and there's space and you can put your stuff down on the table. Not that I've done this particular thing uh, a half a dozen times at least, but yeah, that, that's exactly what happens. So we're going to say sit down at the table. Okay. So here's my card. I'm going to end this here because we're running out of time. Diane, can those be embedded into Who is she? What is she doing here? Yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> um, some of these can be embedded. Um, teacher tube can definitely be embedded because it's just like YouTube. Um, and depend depending on what type of H5P you create, whether you can embed it. Like that, you could get the embed code and put it into your course so that it would be linked. Some of, some of them can be embedded, some of them can't. Um, and I had, there's about 80 different things that you can create in H5P, and I haven't done them all, so I can't definitively say, oh yeah, everything works, because I don't know. So that's the answer. Unfortunately, I haven't used all of those tools that are available in that, that tool set. Um, I do want to say View Pure. So how many of you use YouTube in your course spaces? And you get the commercials and you get the playlists at the end. View Pure, what you do is you take the um, link for the video you want to use and pull it into View Pure and it does it. It does its little magic. And it, I mean, you still have the commercials if there's commercials in there because that's how it's paid. Um, but the end, the playlist at the end, so that if there's things that you don't want them to look at, um, you know, because you never know what's going to come up to view next. It, it gets rid of all of that stuff. So they just, they don't see the commercials on the side. They don't see all the stuff underneath. They don't see the comments. They just watch the video and that's it. And it's not all that distracting stuff. So I know this one, um, that one in particular, View Pure, a few of you would like. And again, um, Crosswords Labs is, is to make a crossword puzzle. So if you have, like you teach a health science course and you want them to review the, the, the um, so you give them the word, the word, a blank space and the definition and you say one across and then they have to put that word in there. They know how many letters it is and they just have to figure out what fits where. Any questions before we're thrown out of here? Teacher tube is just like YouTube, only the content is made by faculty. Whether that's K through 12, whether it's higher ed, there's hundreds of thousands of videos and it's all educational content by educational professionals. I mean, I could say I'm an educational professional, but <laughs> it doesn't mean, so you know, you have, it's the same thing with YouTube. You really have to watch it and say, okay, so that would work if we were in Washington, but it's not going to work in Massachusetts because our laws are a little different or, you know, that, that's not how we do things. Because, you know, Massachusetts, we do our own things our own ways. Rhonda? Yeah, to go back to something you mentioned about uh, copyright. So mm -hmm. Okay, so we do not have a copyright police person. Um, if, if you come in and you say, okay, I've just created this course, can you look at it? Can you give me feedback? One of us will go in and we may say to you, um, instead of putting that whole book in there, which is against copyright, if it's not in you know, the open realm, um, maybe you put a link to where you found it or a link to the library 
where that documentation is available. Because then you're not breaking the copyright law. The student has to go into the library, put in their library code to access that material. Where, you know, somebody could share a link or, or download something from your course space and give it to the whoever, and that's breaking copyright. So, so if you create something and it's yours, you can go into the, there's um, an OER licensing. So you can license it. And you can say, I created this documentation. Anyone can use it. Or anyone can share it, but they can't re, you know, change anything in it. So there's, you know, there's, there's different licensing that you can apply to things that you've created yourself. Um, if you create an online course for Bristol Community College. Now, I'm not saying for anywhere else because I don't speak for anywhere else. But if you create a, a course for Bristol Community College, that is your course, that is your materials. We don't go in there and say, oh, yeah, Joe Schmo, you, you're teaching this class. Well, Rhonda did a great job. We'll just give you all her stuff. That, that's not how it works. Joe Schmo could go to Rhonda and say, I'm going to be teaching this. Would you be willing to share um, if it's a fully online course and it's OER? Sometimes the college will pay a stipend for that person to use your materials. Um, but it's really up to the faculty member who created it because everyone here has academic freedom and everyone has the rights to the things that they create. And don't quote me on any of that because <laughs> it's not, yeah. That may change tomorrow, and, it, and you know. But as far as I know, that that's the rules and the way things work. Thank you, Diane, so very much.